Now that's a methodological issue here, right, that we're going to apply this back black box methodology. One other assumption that we should uh, point out or highlight uh, has been at least implicit uh, throughout the presentation so far, and that is that in the relationships between A and B and between A and C, there is a regularized causal necessary set of correlations right going on in their behaviors that is to say that there is a deterministic system right at work here and this certainly is an important part of the behaviorist package here the behaviors are environmental determinists that all of the behaviors that are resulting here ultimately are conditioned by stimuli that started in the environment and so there's no magic right that goes on in here from their perspective there are no uh, uh, monkeys throwing wrenches right in the works right up at this point here given certain kinds of stimuli it's not possible for whatever it is that's going on here at B to deviate from certain kinds of scripts and so necessarily there are going to be certain kinds of C behaviors here and so this thesis then of environmental determinism is very important to the behaviorists uh, if there is any such thing as freedom volition, uh, self-regulation, uh, uh, any degree of autonomy from a stimuli, uh, then this model is not going to work. And so the environmental determinism is an important part of the, uh, the behaviorist apparatus here. And this, of course, is one of the things that, uh, that leads people to resist behaviorism. They will argue that human beings are creatures that uh, have their own thoughts, that do have free will, do have volition, and so on. What the behaviorists argue is that that is an illusion. They won't deny that we have the experience of free will, but they will argue that free will is not a genuine phenomenon. Instead, everything is deterministic, and they will uh, then trot us through any number of examples to try to, to prove this to us. If you look just, for example, a simple example at how I am dressed. All right, I am wearing standard right, Western male dress of the, uh, the 21st century, right, casual professional dress. Why am I wearing these particular clothes? I could say, well, I made my own autonomous free will types of choices, but the behaviorist will uh, point out that really I didn't, being a person who uh, was born in the late 20th century and who's now existing in the early part of the 20th century. I was born into a certain culture, into a certain kind of social environment, and in that uh, environment I was taught, right, or conditioned that males who are doing certain sorts of things wear these kinds of clothes and women or females wear these kinds of clothes, and under these circumstances this is the appropriate kind of dress, right, and so on. And so I have been conditioned to wear something like this, something or other like this, the exact uh, uh, kind of thing that I would be wearing. There might be some variability here. But they would point out that it would be impossible for me, and in fact, it is impossible for me uh, ever under a circumstance like this to show up uh, wearing a little black dress, right, such that a woman might wear if she was going out on a, on a dinner date, right, or something like that. I have been conditioned such that that uh, kind of attire is not possible to me. But the behaviorist would point out, if I had been raised in a different culture or under different social circumstances and then at the right formative times, I could have been taught that uh, you know, wearing a little back dress is appropriate and that I would be entirely comfortable right, with doing so. So the kinds of dress, for example, that we, that we wear uh, is culturally conditioned, right? It's environmentally conditioned. The language right, that we speak. We're all born into a linguistic culture, and we're bombarded with certain linguistic uh, behaviors by other people. Those serve as stimuli on us. They condition us uh, to, to respond and behave linguistically right, in certain ways. So I speak English, North American English, Middle North American English with the particular accent that I have as a result of cultural conditioning. All right, so those are, are things that uh, uh, might seem like we have lots of choices about, but the environmental determinists will say that we don't really. Uh, take things that maybe seem fairly biological, like just nutritional choices, putting food in the system. The behaviorists will point out that uh, our food preferences are culturally conditioned. Uh, right, I eat certain kinds of foods because those are the kinds of foods my parents fed to me and so I develop certain kinds of preferences, I develop certain kinds of aversions and my preferences and aversions could have been entirely different if I had been raised in a, a different uh, part of the world or at a different time. I always think at this moment of uh, the second Indiana Jones, I think it was the Temple of Doom, Doom rather, movie where Indiana, uh, Indy is the honored guest of some tribe in Africa and uh, they're all very uh, happy to have him there, they're putting on a meal of celebration. 
uh, in his honor and all of the, the natives there are very excited about this special dish that, that, that we're going to have and so everybody is anticipating what's it going to be. And finally it's revealed to us that the special dish is going to be fresh monkey brains and you know, I remember distinctly right at that point in the movie, the gorge rising in my throat, the thought of my eating fresh monkey brains was repulsive to me. Certainly that was the reaction of the character Indiana Jones right at the time. But why are we having that uh, seemingly visceral biological reaction in this particular case? Well, it's not an innate uh, uh, visceral reaction. It's something that was culturally conditioned. It's not something that we're making a choice about. Uh, and the proof of it would be if uh, I or Indiana Jones had been raised in that tribe then my food preferences would be very different. And like the other natives, I would have been dancing around with anticipation, uh, saying, oh great, fresh monkey brains, right, for supper. But it's environmentally conditioned. All right, so food preferences, our choices in dress, uh, the languages that we speak, even things that seem more personal choice uh, and variability, uh, like say religions, right, or political preferences, the environmental determinists can explain in terms of cultural conditioning factors. Here's a, a thought experiment that you, uh, you can't commit uh, or, or, or actually engage in because of uh, grave moral objections to it. But suppose you went to the maternity ward of, uh, of a local hospital and stole 100 babies. Uh, you can understand the, the moral objections here, but suppose you did this as a thought experiment. You take those hundred babies and you ship them off to, uh, say, you place them with uh, devout Islamic families in Saudi Arabia. Fast forward 20 years, what is the religion of those 100 babies whom you've placed with adoption, uh, for adoption there? If you had taken those same 100 babies and placed them with Baptist families in Tennessee, fast forward 20 years, what would their religion be? If you'd taken those same babies and placed them with Hindu families in India or animist religious families in uh, some part of Africa, uh, what you would find again is 99 point whatever percent of those uh, children would grow up to have the religion of the culture in which they are raised. So we all might think that we're making our own religious choices, but really it's simply a matter of, or not necessarily simply, or complexly a matter of certain kinds of uh, cultural conditioning acting upon us. And whatever the strongest uh, and most effective stimuli upon us, that is what leads us to believe, right? Uh, whatever it is we believe in religion and then to engage in the responses. That is to say, the religious rituals and practices and saying the certain things that we do. So, environmental determinism, the behaviorist will argue, is true. Uh, the human being is a stimulus response system. We do have this problem of uh, trying to get observational access to what's going on in B, but methodologically that problem is solvable by using the black box model. And so, the science of psychology, we recast it as a behavioral uh, system. What we're interested in is behaviors, predicting people's behaviors, and then uh, when necessary, controlling their behaviors by controlling the stimuli to which they are exposed, particularly when they are younger. The science of psychology can exist, and it can then also be a practically useful uh, uh, science. Uh, in, in, in our case, we'll turn to the educational implications uh, and now see how the, uh, the science of psychology will dictate certain kinds of educational practices.